Hi, my name is Kadeen Mohammed, and I am the TA Instruments Thermal Analysis Product Manager. In today's webinar, I'll introduce the Discovery DSC Microscope Accessory. With DSC thermograms, as you heat your sample, it may undergo an endothermic or exothermic step change or peak. And if you know the chemistry of your material, then it may be easy to interpret that as a glass transition, melt transition, crystallization peak, or cure reaction. But sometimes there are samples that undergo an endothermic peak where you may not know if that is a solid-solid phase transition or evaporation. And that's where coupling a microscope camera to your DSC can help you better decipher what's going on in your sample. So with the DSC microscope accessory, it allows you, the scientist, to capture images and video of crystallization and melt transitions, the flow of materials above the glass transition and melt transition, volumetric and dimensional changes associated with a phase transition, and visual observations of the color and changes in color uh, to your sample. In today's webinar, I'll cover four different types of materials, uh, the first being a metal sample that undergoes a melt transition, the second a an inorganic salt with a solid-solid phase transition. The third example, a semi-crystalline polymer. And then the last example, which I'll go a bit more into detail into the theory behind that type of material, a pharmaceutical material or pharmaceutical drug that undergoes polymorphism. Before we go into the applications, let's review some of the specifications of this accessory. So the Discovery DSC microscope camera has a high resolution of 1.3 megapixels. And uh, when you are looking at the sample pan positioned into the DSC cell, with a field of view of approximately four to five millimeters, the magnification that you obtain uh, with this field of view is approximately 50 to 65 X. This accessory allows you to capture video and images at the same time. And there is an adjustable polarizer that allows you to uh, minimize the amount of glare that you can obtain from the reflection of the DSC aluminum pans or reflective samples. What is important to note here is that the camera is, ex is compatible with the DSC 2500, 250, and 25 as well as a wide range of cooling accessories. So the LN pump, as well as all of the refrigerated cooling systems, the RCS 120, 90, and 40, and the Findair cooler, that gives you an operational temperature range, depending on the cooling accessory that you have installed, of minus 180 degrees all the way up to 725. So let's look briefly here at the components of the accessory kit. First, we have the microscope camera that is connected to the support frame. The camera itself is connected to the controller or the computer that is controlling the instrument through USB. And then as we look down the frame of that accessory, we have um, quartz windows as well as a support ring for the RCS and liquid nitrogen pump. And then a spacer ring for the fax. The spacer ring allows us to get the entire temperature range of the fax, which is 725. And then there are cutouts within uh, the support ring, as well as the inner and outer silver lids to allow viewing directly above your sample. Setting up the accessory and the software is quite easy, in which you would go to the TRIOS options selections, and in there you'll find an, a checkbox for the microscope camera accessory. By checking this box, it will automatically park and disable the auto sampler if an auto sampler is installed on your DSC, and it will also activate the microscope method segments. 
There are three method segments that are now new to the microscope camera. And you'll see these method segments when you look at the test method in custom mode. So these options are image, video, and dynamic video. You can collect images and video within a single experiment. So with image, you would turn on and off image collection uh, throughout the entire experiment or segment within the experiment. For instance, you can turn on image if you know it's gonna happen in a certain temperature range, if the transition is gonna happen in a certain temperature range. These data files or images are stored within the TRIOS file and can be exported in standard formats such as JPEG. The video segment allows you to turn on and off video uh, during the experiment. The video files are not part of the TRIOS data file, so they are stored as a separate file within the same directory uh, as your TRIOS data file. And then dynamic video, which is a really nice feature of this software, it allows you to capture video clips only when there is a heat flow thermal event taking place. So the instrument is tracking the heat flow signal as well as the derivative of the heat flow signal. And when the second derivative of heat flow exceeds 0.1 milliwatts per second squared, then the camera, the video comes on and it begins to collect data. And then there is a stabilization criteria as well. And so this allows you to collect just video clips throughout the, the length of the experiment, and this reduces the size of the video file. Now as we look at the method segments that are built there for a particular experiment, you can see we started with data storage off, equilibrate to 100 degrees, isothermal for one minute, data storage on, and then image and video collection before beginning the temperature ramp. So in this method, we're looking to collect images and video from 100 degrees to 190 over that time scale. Now, if you were to do experiments that begin in subambient temperatures, so let's say instead of equilibrating at 100 degrees, you were to equilibrate at minus 100 degrees, then I would suggest including at the beginning of the experiment a five minute isothermal so that when the experiment begins, it pre-purges the cell to remove any residential air that might be present inside of the cell, which may have humidity and can condense onto the sapphire windows. So you wanna prevent that fogging of the sapphire windows. So placing a five minute isothermal hold at the start of the experiment before equilibrating to subambient temperature would be ideal. So let's look into some of the examples that uh, I'll cover today. The first here is a DSC of an indium sample. So indium is a metal that is co uh, commonly used to calibrate the instrument for temperature and enthalpy. Usually when we calibrate the DSC, we prepare an indium sample into the DSC pan. It's always suggested that you were to cut a very thin slice of indium position it to the bottom of the pan, and make sure that it's making good thermal contact with the bottom of the DSC pan, because heat has to transfer from the sample through the pan to the DSC sensor. And so as we look at this, we see a very sharp indium melt peak that occurs at 156 degrees. Um, and we also see images that have been captured both before and after the melt. I'll move on to the next slide, which shows a video clip taken at the same, within the same experiment. And here we can see that the temperature of the video clip began at 156.29. And as we begin a temperature ramp, notice that the indium sample begins to move. And as it does so, and it gets closer to 156.6, which is, it is at right now, and then 156.8, you see that the material has undergone a melt transition. Now this sample did not flow and cover the bottom of the pan, but it really just remained in a glob. And that's why we suggest to you, when calibrating the instrument, make sure that that indium is cut thin and is making 
good contact with the sensor, because, with the pan, because uh, you want to have that optimal thermal contact to get the best in your enthalpy measurements. Now in this example, we're looking at uh, potassium nitrate. Potassium nitrate is an inorganic salt, and it has the appearance of a white solid powder. Now as we begin a temperature ramp at 10 degrees C per minute to 400 degrees, we see that there are two endothermic peaks, and I've labeled the region before the first peak as A, after this first peak as B, and then after the second peak as C. So just looking at this DSC thermogram, it would be difficult if you did not know what to expect for this sample. Uh, it would be difficult to interpret whether or not the transition from A and B is a melt transition, and if the transition from B to C is in fact a decomposition peak, or uh, is the transition from A to B a solid-solid phase transformation, and B to C an endothermic peak associated with a melt. And that's where coupling the microscope camera really comes in handy. So we view here some still images at temperatures in the regions of A, B, and C. And what we find is that going from A to B, there are no visual changes in the sample. However, going from B to C, we observe that the sample has melted. And in fact, what's taking place here is at 130 degrees, there is a solid-solid conversion from the orthorhombic crystal structure to a trigonal crystal structure. And the second event, the melt transition that occurs at 3.30 is in fact a melt transition. And then let's move on to looking at a polymer sample. Now what I've shown here is a, a TGA thermogram. So TGA is where we look at the weight stability of a material as it's heated over temperature range. So the TGA measures the changes in weight as a sample undergoes uh, evaporation, desolvation, decomposition. And here with this example, there is a thermogram of polylactic acid being heated over the temperature range of room temperature to 600 degrees. And we notice that there is a major decomposition peak that initiates around 275 degrees Celsius. There is a decomposition peak at 300 degrees, and then the sample moves on to having uh, essentially 100% weight loss at the end of the test. Now, with the microscope accessory, because you need to view the sample, it really is important that you minimize decomposition, sublimation, and evaporation that occurs in your sample. If your sample is going to go through a sublimation process in the temperature range that you're interested in, then the microscope accessory may not be a compatible accessory for that test. Because as the sample sublimes or decomposes, it can begin to contaminate the DSE cell. So first running a preliminary test of TGA to help you determine what test conditions to use for DSC uh, would be a good start. And so here we see that by 275, the sample has undergone 1% weight loss. So if I'm testing this sample on the DSC, then I'll aim to heat it perhaps no more than 250 degrees Celsius. And that's a DSC thermogram that you see as an inset in the plot in which there is a temperature ramp showing an endothermic step change associated with the glass transition, an exothermic peak associated with crystallization, and then a subsequent endothermic peak associated with melt. Let's look at that material a bit more in detail. So what I have here is the DSC analysis of polylactic acid where the sample was first heated, and I'm not demonstrating the first heat of this uh, DSC experiment, but it was first heated to 200 degrees, allowed to melt for five minutes, and then cooled at a controlled rate at 10 degrees C per minute. And that's the plot that we're seeing in which you have that straight line that undergoes a step change at 50 degrees, 
uh, that's the cooling cycle. And we see here that there is no indication of a crystallization or exothermic event taking place in the cool cycle. I take that sample and now reheat it on the DSC. So the heat cycle that you're observing, you see a baseline followed by an endothermic step change, which is the glass transition, a cold crystallization peak, and melting. And as the material goes through these phases, uh, you go from being a solid rigid amorphous prior to the glass transition to a rubbery amorphous after the glass transition. And then as it begins to crystallize, the material goes to a solid crystalline, and as it melts, it goes to a liquid amorphous morphology. Now, because the sample was quenched from its melt, which means the crystallization was inhibited on the cool cycle, if I were to integrate the area between the cold crystallization and the melt, notice there that the total area of that integration gives me an enthalpy of about 0.5 joules per gram, which is a good indicator that this process of cooling at 10 degrees C per minute effectively quenched the sample into a 100% amorphous material. Now, that's a lot of information that I get from looking at the DSC thermogram and understanding how this material behaves, uh, and it helps me to interpret what uh, transitions I'm looking at. However, the benefit of coupling a microscope accessory to the DSC allows me to visualize the changes occurring in that sample. So here we have a screenshot of the TRIO software, and you see that we're able to look at live views um, as well as stored views within the temperature range of the experiment. And so the image we are looking at here is the material before the glass transition at 34 degrees Celsius. And as I click through, you'll note that now that we're above the glass transition, there was a slight change, and I'll go back for a second. There was a slight change in the visual look of the sample. As I continue to heat, this material that is amorphous has no crystal structure in it. As I continue to heat, because this material has a tendency to crystallize, the molecules begin to orient into order, and we see that it begins to crystallize. On crystallizing, the crystal domains will diffract light, which means the sample now goes from being clear to becoming cloudy and opaque. And as I click through, at the peak of the crystallization, notice here the sample is completely opaque. As I continue to heat that material, it undergoes a melt transition. So the sample is now melted, but the higher in temperature I go, the viscosity decreases and the sample flows along the bottom of the pan. Now, at the same time, I can simultaneously collect video uh, files through these transitions. I'm going to click through here. There are three videos embedded on this slide. I'm going to begin with the glass transition, the crystallization, and then the melt peak. So if you keep an eye on the middle video clip, which shows the crystallization, you see the samples going from clear to cloudy. And it does so in a very short period of time. And that's occurring during the crystallization peak. As I continue to look at the third video, notice now we're in that temperature range where the sample is beginning to melt. And as it melts, it begins to spread on the bottom of the pan. Really, so this gives you some indication if you were to take the sample slightly above its glass transition, but below the crystallization peak, there are some morphological changes occurring that affects the visual look of the sample. And that's uh, good information to have, especially as you process the material or expose the material to high temperatures. All right, so let's move into the last application. And for this application, I'm going to go over pharmaceutical polymorphism. I'll spend some time building the theory of polymorphism discussing the differences between a monotropic and enantiotropic polymorph, and then after that, give some examples of uh, using the microscope accessory to 
help interpret the results. So what is polymorphism? If you have a material that has crystalline structure, polymorphism is having the same crystal, chemical structure but different crystal forms. There are typically, there are two polymorphic uh, schemes. One of them would be monotropic polymorphism in which one crystal structure or polymorph is the most stable over the entire temperature range of which that material is exposed. And then there is enantiotropic polymorphism where different polymorphs are stable over different temperature ranges. Uh, the chemistry of a polymorph or crystal structure would be the same, but the different crystal structure can have some real effects on the way that material goes through solubility, dissolution rates, bioavailability, and so on. So uh, the most stable polymorph has the lowest Gibbs free energy and has the lowest solubility, dissolution rate, and bioavailability. And the most stable polymorph has the highest melting point only if it's a monotropic polymorph and has the highest latent heat of melting only if it is a monotropic system. So as we go through today's uh, presentation, I'm going to demonstrate how using DSE by itself does not tell you if a material is monotropic or enantiotropic, but you need to understand the Gibbs free energy plot of that material, and you would have to uh, generate multiple experiments. Let's start with monotropic polymorphs. In this Gibbs free energy plot, what you observe is form two has the lowest Gibbs free energy and is the most stable over the entire temperature range. And the melting point of form two is at a higher temperature. Form one is least stable over the entire temperature range and has a low melting point. Now let's look at some possible DSC scenarios. If I were to start with form two, which is the most stable over the entire temperature range that you're reviewing, form two will not convert to form one. So therefore, if I were to heat form two, I will observe the melt transition of that polymorph. If I were to start the test with form one, which is the least stable, so whatever your manufacturing process is, if you created form one, uh, and that is the least stable of the two polymorphs, then as you begin to heat it, it will convert from form one to form two. And then form two will melt at its melting temperature. So those were the two top cases, uh, which, you're doing, which you're performing at relatively modest heating rates in the DSC, somewhere between five, 10, 20 degrees C per minute. Uh, which are standard DSC heating rates. However, if I were to heat at faster rates, then I may have different um, performances or behaviors. If I start with the most unstable form and I heat very quickly, then I may be able to observe what is the melt temperature of form one. And notice here that it's going to be at a lower temperature than the melt transition of form two. If I heat fast, but perhaps not fast enough, I can observe the melt transition of form one, but then it reorders or crystallizes into form two, which is the exothermic uh, event there on the last um, plot. And then the form two begins to melt, uh, which would happen at the temperature of the melt transition of form two. So those are the possible, the four possible scenarios of what you may observe in a monotropic system. Let's look at enantiotropic polymorphs. With enantiotropic polymorphs, depending on the temperature range, uh, a specific polymorph will be most stable. So in this case, form two is most stable until we get to the temperature of polymorphic change. Um, in that case, where the intersection of the Gibbs free energy of form one and two intersect, um, now beyond that temperature of polymorphic change, form one is now more stable. And form one has a higher temperature uh, 
temperature of melting. So let's look at some possible scenarios. If form two is stable below this temperature of polymorphic change, then as I cross that temperature, and we're looking at the plots from the top go down, if I cross that temperature of polymorphic change, form two will convert into form one. And as I continue to heat that sample, I will see the melt transition of form one. If I started the test with the unstable form one, in the range below the temperature of polymorphic change, form two is more stable. So if you start with one, form one will convert into form two. And then as you cross that temperature of polymorphic change, form two will convert back to form one. And as you continue to heat it, to heat the sample, form one will melt. Now, in the bottom two scenarios, we're looking at uh, starting with the most unstable form, form two, in that particular temperature range, but we're going at fast heating rates. So if I were to heat very quickly, instead of being able to view the conversion of form two to form one, I may be able to observe the melt transition of the least stable form of form two. If I were to heat fast, form two may melt, but then recrystallize into form one, and then form one would melt. So these again are some possible DSC scenarios that you may observe if testing your sample at different heating rates. And it is a good idea to test pharmaceutical materials that undergo polymorphic changes at heating rates that vary over a wide temperature ra um, rate. So perhaps anywhere from one degree C per minute, 20, 50 degrees C per minute, 100, 200 degrees C per minute, and so on. Okay, so in um, this example for pharmaceuticals, I've chosen to use talbutamide as the example that uh, we'll demonstrate here today. And talbutamide is a material that undergoes enantiotropic polymorphism. It's a drug that's used to manage type 2 diabetes. And what we have here is first a, DS, a TGA thermogram, in which we're looking at weight percent versus temperature um, to record what is the thermal stability of this material over this temperature range. And I observed that at 177 degrees, there's already a 1% weight loss associated with decomposition. So in studying this material on the DSC, I will try to stay below 177 degrees. And as we see here, uh, a DSC test was carried out, and I'll just go back one. A DSC test was carried out in which I first looked at the transition that's occurring at 40 degrees, so I cycled back and forth in that temperature range. And then on the second heat, continued to heat the sample uh, through the melt of the material, but stopping before the temperature, before the material begins to decompose. Um, we'll see a bit more of an expanded view of this experiment as we move ahead. Now, one of the rules that I'd like to point out uh, which is important in identifying enantiotropic polymorphs would be Berger and Ramberger's rules. So in these rules, you have the heat of transition rule in which an endothermic transition from one solid polymorph to another is observed. If this happens, if you observe an endothermic peak and it is a solid-solid transition, then the system is enantiotropic as well as if the heat of fusion of the higher melting form is at a, um, a lower enthalpy, then the two forms are enantiotropic. So let's look at an illustration of this by viewing a, an enthalpy and a Gibbs-free energy plot. So what we have at the very top of this plot is an enthalpy plot of form one uh, and form two. As a material, as form one undergoes a melt transition, notice the enthalpy line of form one has a shorter distance to travel as it steps from the enthalpy 
of a crystalline form one to the amorphous state. So the enthalpy of form one is smaller. The enthalpy of form two is a larger value. And as we look at the Gibbs free energy plot at the bottom of that uh, illustration, what you have is form one is most stable until you get to this temperature of polymorphic change. When the lines intersect for the Gibbs free energy plot of form one and two, then form two converts to form one and beyond that temperature form one is most stable. So let's look at the example here. So this is talbutamide and uh, as mentioned, the test performed is first equilibrate to 50, minus 50 degrees. Notice there's a five minute isothermal at the beginning of the test. This is again to make sure that we clear out the residual air that's inside of the DSC cell. That residual air may have humidity by purging it out for five minutes before changing the temperature of the cell. We're filling the cell with a dry inert gas in this case, we ran with a uh, nitrogen purge, and that way you get a better visual on your sample um, at the subambient temperatures. So first equilibrate, sorry, isothermal for five minutes, equilibrate to minus 50, uh, begin data storage on, turn image capture on, turn dynamic video capture on, and begin a ramp to 65, cool back down to minus 50, so we're really just doing a cyclical test to study the transition that's occurring at 40 degrees. And then after that second heat through that transition, continue to 160 degrees. By using the dynamic video segment here, what I'm ensuring is I'm getting the video clips in the temperature range where a thermal event is taking place. So I'm not generating a large video file uh, where, it's, where it shows uh, the sample going through a zero heat flow change. So I'm really targeting just the temperature regions in which the sample is going through a transition. And so as we review this data here, uh, there are uh, images at 25 and 45 degrees on the heat and cool cycles the blue being the heat cycle, the red line being the cool cycle, in addition to having a video embedded in this slide, and I'm gonna play that video. As we look at the video clip, as well as the images, we note that this peak is reversible on both the heat and cool cycles, but there are no physical changes, no visual, I should say, no visual changes to the material. It's not going through a melt and recrystallization. In fact, what it's going through is a solid, solid phase transition, which is very indicative of an enantiotropic system. Now on the second heat cycle, if I were to now then take that material above 45 degrees and continue to heat to 160, again, staying below the decomposition temperature of the sample, I noticed that the video clips, or, or I'm sorry, the images show me that between 25, I'm sorry, 110 to 128 degrees, the sample is still very solid. However, between going from 128 to 133, where the sample onset of the melt is 128, we see that it's gone from a solid powder to a liquid. So that is a true endothermic melt peak. And I will play a quick video clip in the temperature range of 125 and 128. And as you view it, you see that the white powder, um, which is scattered on the bottom of the pan, so you also see some of the DSE aluminum pan in this uh, image. You see here that as the sample gets to 128, the material begins to melt. And really that's such a good confirmation uh, to let you know which transition is a solid solid transformation versus which is a melt transition. So that's it for today's webinar. Hopefully I've demonstrated some applications today that will help you uh, see where you may possibly use the microscope accessory in your DSC studies. Uh, once again, just to confirm, the DSC coupled with the microscope accessory 
allows you to look at images and video clips of a material as it undergoes crystallization and melt transitions. The flow of the material above its glass transition and above its melt region, any volumetric or dimensional changes that occur as it goes through the phase transition, as well as to observe any visual changes, uh, whether it be in the color or uh, transparency of the sample as you heat over a temperature range. And with that, I'd like to thank you for joining me here today. And uh, for those who are attending the live webinar today, I'll stick around for uh, questions and answers. And then for those of you who have, are viewing the video clip later on, uh, feel free to click on the links to look at the resources that have been uplo uploaded. Thank you and have a great day. Hi everyone, um, I'm just switching over here to my uh, landline so that we'd have a better um, connection. Okay, so thanks again for joining uh, the webinar today. Let me look at some of the questions that are coming in uh, through the Q&A manager. Um, okay, the first uh, question, can the microscope be used to 700 degrees Celsius? And the answer to that is yes. We have um, engineered the accessory to have a full temperature range of minus 180 degrees Celsius to 725 degrees Celsius. It all depends on the cooling accessory that you have connected to your DSC cell. So for instance, if you have an LN pump, the liquid nitrogen pump, where the temperature range of that accessory on the DSC cell is minus 180 to 550, um, then in order to get to 700 degrees, you would have to replace the liquid nitrogen pump cooling accessory on your DSC cell with the Fendair cooling system, which we call um, by the acronym of FACS. So you would replace that cooling accessory, whether it's the liquid nitrogen or the RCS refrigerated cooling systems that go up to 400 or 550 depending on the model that you have, you would swap it out with the Fendair cooling system which goes from room temperature to 725. Once that cooling accessory is attached to your DSC cell, this microscope camera can be used um, to obtain that temperature range. Um, with, uh, with the temperature range as well, one of the things I'd like to mention is it only takes about five minutes to install this microscope accessory above your DSC cell. Um, it does take a bit longer to swap out the cooling accessory, so if you change from the RCS to the fax, then you will need to recalibrate your DSC or reapply a saved calibration, verify the temperature um, and baseline of the instrument, and then begin uh, performing your tests. Okay, so let's see. The next question um, is, um, could you discuss the polarizer on the microscope as well as there's another question in terms of are there any full pl plans to uh, include a fully polarized microscope? And those are two questions that are more or less the same. Um, and so with this accessory, as you can see, um, the field of view is truly just uh, the diameter of the DSC pen, um, which is about five millimeters. And then yes, you can zoom in a bit more um, to get a close-up on your sample, but by no means is it a um, fully polarized microscope. Um, at this point in time, uh, we don't have any engineering projects going on to include a fully polarized microscope. However, for the individuals who are asking these questions, what I'd like to do is um, I'll contact you directly to discuss your application's needs um, 
and then uh, we can see what can be done as a potential non-standard product that uh, we can work with you on. Um, so I have your contact information through sign up of the webinar. So feel free um, if that is a need that you have to put a note here into this window as well as um, contact me directly after the webinar and we can, uh, we can certainly talk about that. Um, can this be used with the Q20 DSC? So unfortunately, no, the, the, um, the hardware can be. So you can directly couple this microscope camera um, on a Q series DSC. However, the instrument controls for triggering um, camera or image collections, video collections, and the file format into the software those are um, specifically developed for the Discovery Series platform. Um, if you have a Q20 DSE or Q Series instrument and you'd like to, uh, to learn more about this microscope accessory, um, contact your local TA representative and we'll certainly work with you to see what we can do to get you up and running. Um, does the sample need to be a specific color or presentation? Um, that's a really good question. So the sample, ideally you want to have um, a sample shape or dimension where you have some contrast of that sample against the aluminum pan. So it's a, the DSA pan is aluminum. Um, ideally you don't want the sample to fully cover the bottom of the pan. You would like to have some contrast between the edges of the sample and um, the, the aluminum pan. However, I've tested clear samples, clear pellets, clear films, um, as well as white and uh, metallic samples on uh, in the DSC pan with the microscope accessory. And um, usually you can get pretty good um, good contrast and good uh, images off those samples. I've also looked at samples that change color with temperature, so maybe a material that goes from changing from red to blue or yellow to green, and um, I'm able to also observe those ch changes as well. Um, there is a question here about what is the cost of the system. Um, Again, feel free to contact your local TA representative, but what we're looking at is approximate, approximately $11,000 as the, as the approximate cost of, um, of the full accessory with um, the adapters needed to put onto your DSC cell. All right, and um, so far those look like uh, the main questions that came in. Um, what I'd like to do, again, is encourage you to continue to send your questions to us here at TA regarding this webinar or any um, general que questions you might have. Um, thank you again for joining me in today's webinar. I hope that you found the information to be useful, um, but I'd also like to ask that you please send us ideas for topics that you would like to hear more about. And I'm sure here at TA, many of our applications engineers and product managers would be happy to um, review your request and respond to your needs for specific topics. Uh, once again, thank you and have a great day. Hope to see you again soon.